For those who are struggling with GR, I'm here to help. You just gotta give a like and subscribe to my channel, deal? So, seriously, what is a dual vector? All those mathematical descriptions from the book just give you stresses, right? I'll try to explain the concept for you. So, there are vectors and dual vectors. This one is the vector that we all know, and it's part of a vector space, T sub P. And this one is a dual vector, which is part of a dual vector space. T stands for tangent, and P stands for plane. So, basically a tangential plane. Dual vector space has an asterisk, which means cotangent. I'll go straight to the point. When vector has information of an object, dual vector has information of the object's background, or information of an interacting object. If I compare it, vector space is these sailboats on an ocean, and each sailboat is a vector. Say there was a storm on the ocean, dual vector space would be a group of hurricanes, and each hurricane would be a dual vector. What would be the ocean? No, ocean is nothing. It's a calm ocean, we're just gonna assume it's not gonna affect anything. So, hurricanes are just there as the background, and sailboats are the objects that are moving. Alright? Say these sailboats are inside this one hurricane, dual vector, and these arrows are just wind streams, which are the dual vector elements. Imagine these sailboats are on right here, on this wind stream. Let's place our object, the vector, on the graph. I'll pick the red one as an example. So this red boat is going to be our vector. It travels one meter at a time. And our wind stream, the dual vector element, describes the wind force. I'm assuming that the dual vector element is constant throughout this region at least. So the boats are not aware of the other dual vector element. This could be regarded as just a dual vector itself. By the Pythagorean theorem, the magnitude should be 2 newtons in this case. How much energy would be applied to our sailboat for 1 meter of travel? It would be just the force component in the same direction times the distance, right? Which should be square root of 3 joules. Now, how about with the green sailboat? I wanted to compare with the red boat, so I normalized the vector so it goes 1 meter at a time as well. And this boat is moving in the same direction as the wind. Now, how much energy would be applied to the sailboat? All force would be applied since they have the same direction. So, 2 newtons times 1 meter, 2 joules. Didn't you notice anything? Yeah, pretty much this is the inner product, or dot product, or scalar product. I mean, they are all the same thing. This is an example of a vector and a dual vector. If you multiply a vector and a dual vector, they should be producing a scalar value, just like the inner product. I know it may not be clear to you yet, but just remember this for now. A vector contains information of an object, and a dual vector contains information of a background. Again, a vector contains information of an object, and a dual vector contains information of a background. And when you multiply the two, you should be getting a scalar value, alright? And that's actually why I specifically chose the physical quantity force as a dual vector. So it can provide energy, which is scalar quantity. Note it down, then continue the video. Now, before going any further, you might be asking this. If multiplying a vector and a dual vector was the inner product, which ones were vectors and which ones were dual vectors back in our high school? Well, if this was the inner product, would that have mattered? Because a dot b and b dot a are the same anyway. Yeah, so back in high school, we didn't really have to know which one is a vector and which one is a dual vector. 
It wouldn't have caused any troubles to us when learning the inner product. In GR, it does matter. Dual vector should be the background object, right? So let's differentiate them. Let's change the way of writing. We're going to capitalize the vectors and keep the dual vectors as the lower cases. But not only this. We used to put an arrow on top of each letter, right? Let's use this now instead. Index mu is the positions of the element. Also for the dual vector, we're going to use this. Do you see another difference? We use a subscript mu instead of the superscript for the dual vector. This is another important rule, so remember that. So now we are going to change these expressions like this. Let's compare with the high school level inner product. You see, a scalar number shouldn't have any elements. It's just a single value, right? So we shouldn't be having these indices. In fact, when we have one superscript and one subscript, they can be canceling each other. And we call this mathematical operation contraction. More about contraction will be covered in a future video. So back to the sailboat. We just had the red and the green boats traveling the same distance on the same background, but they still gained different amount of energies. Why was that? That's of course because one was not aligned with the background, but the other one was. So the wind was valued differently in the two boats. Now, instead of comparing two sailboats, let's just talk about one sailboat. So the boat itself is a vector that describes its movement. And we have constant wind streams. This as a whole makes a dual vector a hurricane as one form. By the way, dual vector actually is called one form. Many physicists prefer the name one form, or at least I do. Now, how could this energy change? It should decrease as the boat gets misaligned with the one form. It's a pretty obvious thing, right? Now, here comes the real question. Is this the only way to have the energy change gradually in this way? What if our boat was just sailing forward and it was just the wind that was changing its direction? The energy could decrease in the exact same way, no? Also, what if the wind stayed on course but was actually getting weakened? This could also give the same result. So I'm not touching the object but instead manipulating the background. What if you were a blind person, sailing on this boat, feeling some energy push, and noticed that the energy was changing? How would you know if it was the boat that turned the direction, or if it was the wind, or if it was just the wind that got weakened? Let's assume that the boat could turn very gently so you cannot notice the turn, nor you cannot feel the wind directly. You have only noticed the energy change somehow. There will be no way for you to know what caused the energy to decrease. This is why knowing the information of dual vector is also important. At this moment, there is no way you can know what caused the energy to change. Now, what does that have to do with GR? I'll give you a hint. Long time ago, one person thought that two masses attract each other with a force. But another person thought that masses are not attracting each other, but it's just the space-time that is curved. Can you guess? Basically, Isaac Newton was saying that the boats were changing their directions or slowing down or speeding up. But Albert Einstein was saying that it's the wind stream, the dual vector in the background, that was changing. Hmm, dual vector and curved space-time. Are you seeing where I'm trying to get? By the way, this drawing is a bit misrepresented. I'll try to show a better representation. Our dual vector element, also called one form element, was a wind stream. I'm now revealing the truth. 
This was equivalent to space-time in GR. If the scale of the space-time is constant throughout the universe, the applying magnitude to the boat won't change. But what if the space-time itself is compressed or stretched? It will affect some physical corners of the boat. So what is that space-time block? You can think of it as the front plane representing the 3D space and the thickness representing the time dimension. So I'm showing a four-dimensional box in a comprehensible way. By the way, to have the time dimension as a space-like component, we multiply it by the speed of light, c. That concept is from special relativity. Imagine we have space-time unit boxes, and there's a vector traveling in the boxes. Going through each box is equivalent to spending one second of time. With these boxes, this vector is 3 meters per second in the i-hat direction because the spatial coordinate is 1,0,0. ,0. But let's say there is another world where the space-time unit boxes look like this. And this vector just visited this world. Now the vector itself didn't change, but the velocity is 6 meters per second. It is the different space-time scale that increased the vector's velocity. So we can say that vectors produce relative values depending on the sizes of the one-form element. And by the way, force space-time dual vector could be expressed like this. What if there's a world where the size of the space-time unit boxes varies? The velocity will keep changing. Doesn't that mean accelerating? And doesn't that mean there exists a force? It was the dual vector space, our curved universe, that was causing accelerations, not forces. And by the way, you may be asking, then shouldn't the object be moving in the first place? In fact, our universe is constantly expanding. There's no place where you can stand fixed. The expanding universe is already causing everything to move. So. A massive object affects dual vector space, making the space-time to curve. Physical quantities around the curvature are affected, such as velocity. I hope you got the concept of the dual vectors. But you still want to see some actual math, right? Don't worry, I'll show it to you now. A popular example of dual vector in mathematics is gradient of a scalar. Gradient of a scalar gives vector, right? So I'm saying it was actually a dual vector. If we bring this definition to physics, there's a very well-known physical quantity in physics, field. Let's think about the electric field. You probably know that the electric field is gradient of a scalar potential or electric potential, which is negative kq over r. Yeah, so gradient of a scalar, that is a dual vector. Electric fields were dual vectors. In fact, we visualize the electric fields in this way, as if it's some kind of a background object. How about gravitational field? We should know a gravitational potential first. It's negative gm over r. We already learned this from high school. So if there exists a scalar potential, one can always take the gradient of a scalar, and that would be the dual vector. By the way, you want to know something surprising? Can you actually do this math? Take the gradient of the gravitational potential? Let's try it. So gradient of the scalar should be d over dr minus gm over r, and that should be gm over r squared. We know that gravitational force is gmm over r squared, and force is equal to ma. So that means gravitational acceleration is the gravitational field, weight. Gravitational field is the gravitational acceleration? Acceleration is field? 